are these people? Hey, Andy. Mm. You're Jewish, What's up, right? dude? <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's so, it, it's been an interesting time for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, but we've had private conversations about this topic, and we've been meaning to have this topic on <laughs> INM for a while. Um, but we figured we're going to do it tonight, since uh, and just to be totally transparent uh, with our fam in the chat, um, I should have posted that tweet, but I posted a tweet regarding. Zionism and how I personally feel it kind of hijacks any movement as far as black liberation. Because, and I'll get to more of the reason why I said that later. Um, Sammy asked me to come on her show uh, <laughs> tomorrow, which unfortunately I can't because I have uh, local activism and stuff that I have to do tomorrow night, so I can do it. Um, but I kind of wanted to get ahead of this in terms of since we wanted to have this conversation anyway and, you know, and talk to you, I think, more publicly about what we've been kind of talked about. Um, yep. But I do want to say, Indy, you know, I definitely, I think especially in light of, you know, what's been happening with Gaza, I really do appreciate you uh, having these conversations with you kind of in a safe space in terms of, I think, you know, obviously understanding your perspective uh, on this as a Jewish man, but also, you know, just given how you are totally against what Israel is doing and how you don't uh, advocate for what is happening. Um, yeah. But I think also understanding my frustration as a Black person uh, in having the discussion of, you know, especially like I've seen, <clears throat> you know, online many Jewish people in light of this issue um, were kind of like, oh, well, Black people, you need to support us in terms of Israel because we supported you in regards to George Floyd and all this other stuff back in history. And, and, it, just helped, and it just made me feel like, so you're you're looking for our solidarity based on what exactly the idea that we were allegedly in solidarity with each other during the civil rights movement but you haven't necessarily been necessarily working in solidarity for other things as far as our liberation so so yeah, I I think I have definitely have been frustrated with that over the last few months, and I think you've definitely helped to kind of help me kind of think through those things safely, but also kind of recognize where I'm kind of at in terms of um, how, as a Black person, how I should be um, kind of be resonant of you in terms of how you believe in what your beliefs are, especially in light of this assault. Uh, but I think how to properly have these conversations and not take it personally against each other, but then like knowing, you know, we'll ultimately, I think especially you and I wanting the same thing in the end. So I really appreciate you, you know, making it so it, it made me feel very comfortable to talk to you about these things. And you know, having an outlet to kind of vent my frustration in this issue. You got to have the hard conversations and we got to listen to the things that make us uncomfortable. And that's something that I think that too many, definitely the Zionists are fragile snowflakes when it comes to this shit. They cannot even hear the word Palestine. It makes them cringe. It literally does. And it's, it's hard. Look, I was raised Zionist. I was raised by Zionists. And I still have a lot of people who are still connected that have not woken up and figured out the difference, even given all the crap that's happened over the last <clears> six <throat> months. And that, it's like, I want to pull my fucking hair out. Or they secretly, privately acknowledge it behind the scenes in a private conversation one-on-one, -on -one, but they they keep their mouth shut otherwise. they Because they... There's, there's a lot, you know, there's community, family, all kinds of potential relationships that could be at stake. And literally, families are 
splitting over the um, the opinions over what's ha- the massacre and people who are standing by it and saying Israel has a right to defend itself, even after six months and massacring tens of thousands and ten plus thousand kids, they're still all in. And it's like, how how do you square that? How do you? Yeah. So some families have chosen to just not not address it at all, um, and to just. And that's hard because as you see these things happening, they don't see it happening because it's not reported in the corporate media and in the media where they are consuming, but we are flooded with it and inundated with it 24 seven because our news feeds amplify what we already see. And because we are looking for it in order to find out what the hell is actually happening from the perspective of the people it's happening to, not just the people who are actually committing ethnic cleansing at the moment and the people who are funding that. Um, Now, when it comes to solidarity Mm -hmm. with the black community, and again, you sent me a couple of these articles. We've been talking about this for a while because there has been this kind of, we were always told we're, we're kindred spirits, you know, nobody wants Jews. And in this country, you know, black people have been oppressed and had a struggle for, you know, centuries, and you know that's what we were taught effectively. And there, there, I, re- I read a couple of these articles you sent over. So let, let's go through one. There was one outstanding paragraph where they're basically told, you know, the liberal upper class Jewish people are saying if you align with the the black, you know, the black community, that is that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of alignment and a lot of parallels there. Now I will argue, and we're going to discuss how. There are not that there are some, but there are a lot of stark differences. Right. And I'm going to let you, you go from there. Speaking of that. So I pulled this article from women, Jewish women's archive. Uh, So this is the titles tensions in black Jewish relations written by Judith Rosenbaum. Um, And she writes, let's see, siblings in oppression, hence the title of this segment. Um, There is a long history of black Jewish partnership in the American civil rights movement and just as long of a history of tension and misunderstandings. From the beginnings of organized civil rights activism in the early 20th century, Jews were prominent leaders, participants, and financial backers of the movement, counting among the founders and lead supporters of organizations such as the NAACP and the National Urban League. On the judicial path towards the advancement of civil rights, Jews played important roles as lawyers and judges. American Jews have often felt a kingship with African Americans based on shared minority status and a cultural memory of slavery, albeit a much more immediate history for African Americans. In the mid 20th century, certain conditions contributed to this sense of identification. The recent history of the Holocaust made many American Jews more attuned to discrimination and racism and more committed to opposing it. In addition, the widespread post-war financial success of American Jews boasted their confidence that the American ideals of equality and meritocracy from which they had benefited could also work for African Americans, not realizing that anti-Black racism made the African American experience significantly different from the Jewish case. For their part, some African Americans who grew strength from biblical stories of slavery and God's redemption and witnessed Jews' active commitment to civil rights, also saw Jews as partners in their struggle. So actually, um, I want to say something here, because this is the, that's a part that I kind of struggled with. Well, not struggled with, but this is something that I definitely experienced. You know, and I think for... For both you and the and I, we well, you live in Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey as a teen, and I went to middle school. And you know where I went to middle school, as I told you the town. Uh, but it was predominantly Jewish. So here I was, this one of the few in a class of sixteen. I was like one of five black kids, uh, and especially for me, given that I was uh, an immigrant, so I was extra special. I was the extra token in that class. But even back then, I always kind of wondered why were my Jewish peers, they lived in great homes, 
they had, you know, access to things financially that I couldn't afford, you know, like uh, they lived in the better towns, they went to the better schools, and here I was living, I call it ghetto light, um, uh, in the oranges in New Jersey, um, so there was me and there was them. So like, so even at school for me, yeah, I, I mean, I liked my friends, the ones who were Jewish. I generally liked them. But I think there was always kind of this distance between us because they lived a life that they didn't necessarily have to live. You know, like at the end of the day, after school, I went back to my town, you know, where, you know, I saw drugs. I saw, you know, a lot of, hurt and pain and suffering and a lot of these kids didn't necessarily have to see that if at all so so there was always this kind of divide for me growing up in terms of having to kind of be around them but being around that um affluence and kind of having being in the vicinity of but never having direct access to it kind of bothered me you know, at, in middle school. And then, and I think that kind of grew for me in terms of, you know, going into high school and college where I was in more mixed white um, groups, but there was still affluence there um, that I could never, yeah, it just really bothered me, you know, in terms of that, how there was this, you know, like, as this article said, a kingship because, which I didn't quite learn at the time, but it was like, you know, they liked me, obviously, you know, was, you know, whatever, but at the end of the day, they didn't live the life that I lived. And so that was where that disconnect for me has always been. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, for many Jewish people, even now today, I think while they might sympathize, I don't think really a lot of them, unless they really are intimately involved in the Black struggle, it's something that I find for some um, are not really that resonate. It doesn't resonate with them in that way. So I, in a lot of ways, I kind of feel somewhat superficial in terms of that relationship. Um, but yeah, that's. I just wanted to share that, just in terms of how I kind of felt well, we, you know, growing up. And we that. were taught on, we were taught on the kindred spirit side, kind of like, look, they're my, they're seen as a minority, clearly, as are you. So we stand up for each other against the majority because that could just as easily be you, right. except it couldn't. And that is what I very quickly learned early on is that there were, first of all, the ability to blend in effectively is, is, is what I'm talking about, you know, right. that, and, and, and it's, it's pigmentation is literally the difference and it will cause all kinds of discrimination and feelings. And this is of course, well documented, but, but it's a lot harder. A lot of times people have thought that I was Italian and not that it matters. And, What's even more fucked up, and we had this conversation, and shout out to, to our friend Oz, because Oz comes and hangs out with us quite often. You know, Oz was talking about, like, Jewish as a nationality or as a race versus a religion, and I said, this is where they fucked us up all, because they've now made it so that Jewish is a race, even though right. it's really not, because not. there are Jews from everywhere. There are right. Jews from everywhere. Right. It only it's is when it's convenient for them. Like Right. Yeah. Right. But I think religion but they it's convenient in terms of benefiting in some regard. You know, yeah. but <clears throat> but yeah, as yeah, it's the idea of Jewish Judaism as a race. Cause simply put, it can be black Jews, right? So there are. There, there are, are a whole lot of them. Right. So how can that be a race? When Our friend Marcus Cage, shout out right, to Marcus, which I think he was in the chat earlier. Uh, shout out to you, Marcus. But like, so I never quite understood the idea of you know Judaism as a race. And I mean, as you said, you know, like 
for many of my Jewish, pretty much all of my Jewish friends, at least growing up, they were white. So they didn't necessarily, unless they told you that they were Jewish, they didn't necessarily have to say that they were Jewish or not. I can't hide my blackness, you know, unless if I did some stuff to my skin and I look fake as hell. But even then, like, you will know that I'm still black. So at least for you, you can hide that aspect of your identity if you chose to, especially, like, if you're in a in sense of danger for you. But I can't hide right. that aspect of my identity given, you know, my skin color. So, um, but anyway, let's continue uh, with this. At the same time, latent tensions always existed between the two communities. Some Black people viewing the inequality and asymmetry between the experiences of the two groups resented Jewish feelings of moral proprietorship in the civil rights struggle. The geographic closeness of the two groups who often shared neighborhoods frequently as a result of the exclusion of Black and Jews from other areas, could lead to tension as well. African-Americans' main contact with Jews was often in the form of landlords or shop owners, and some resented Jews for making a profit off their community. When many Jews participating in white flight left inner-city neighborhoods for the suburbs and better educational opportunities for their children, their African-American neighbors often felt abandoned, blamed for urban problems, and resentful that they did not have the same opportunities to move elsewhere. And this is something my they were dad also is, the landlords. Right. This is yeah. something my dad has mentioned to me. You know, he grew up in Barbados, he immigrated to the UK, and he mentioned him and members of the black community, you know, obviously, you know, like he was they were rejected from getting apartments from Jewish landlords. They were not able to venture into patron into jewish establishments given that they were black and you know my dad is from a generation he's biden's generation so he had he's and i've said a lot of things about my dad i've said them to you probably to you too privately but i understand like he has issues with jewish people like and well, I he went through segregation, why. man. Like right. you know, so, right? But considering what he went through, like I more than understand it. But more importantly, it's the idea, and this is something I think we'll unpack a little later. But I think the biggest thing that mm. kind of concerns me with Jewish people is the idea of mostly you look to us for you look to solidarity, not you, but like Jewish people in general look to solidarity with Black people when it comes for social issues. But when it comes to issues as far as economics, especially in terms of having us as Black people be economically viable, that's kind of where I think a lot of that tension is. And the idea, like the stereotype, it's like, oh, Jews are known to make money or whatever. You know, I heard that trope growing up, you know? But I think a lot of it is stemmed from the idea of because eventually at some point when Jews were kind of accepted into whiteness and then I think just as a community given your faith, you guys were able to band together and become more financially, you know, stable. Well, I, I think to- that the financial end bought our way into respectability and legitimacy with a community that wanted nothing to do with Jews and thinks that our religion is weird, but in a lot of cases, they wanted something from us that they did not necessarily want or need or were going to get financially, you know, that they didn't... Black people didn't have the wealth. That's the bottom line. It's, you know, again, it's wealth versus rich. And, and, uh, you know, we talked about the Chris Rock thing about Rich versus wealth, you know, the Jews were able to accumulate generational wealth. Right. In, they, they did not have, you know, the average life expectancy in the 30s and 40s like like Black Americans did during the Reconstruction era even. Um, th- again, th- 
Jews fought alongside and fought for the black community 100%. Also, again, for self-preservation. They saw right. what was happening. No. But again, I think it's the idea mm. of... Yeah, in terms of self-preservation, yeah. Like, you, uh, they aligned with us in that regard. But again, not so much with economic issues, especially pertaining to black people. Personally, I haven't felt that kind of solidarity, you know, and again, not just from Jews, but from everybody across the board. So, you know, so, um, but I think that's one of the issues that I have, um, that I have mentioned to you privately in, in terms of that. Uh, but anyway. Well, again, you know, Zionists have this Jewish supremacy thing. And again, mm -hmm. raised by Zionists, therefore, a lot of the values and things that I hold came from that movement and God's, some of them are good some of them a lot of them are not but god's chosen people um well you know. again let my people go you know like look yes this is can't change how i was raised i can only un undo the programming and acknowledge and try to educate others as to what i've learned uh, a lot of people are still like with, like with the matrix they're not ready to be unplugged and it really upsets them it's almost like and I hate to ever compare myself, but shooting the messenger, getting angrier at the person who's delivering the news to you because you don't like what's being said. There's a guy sitting in Belmarsh prison because pretty much he delivered exactly news that was inconvenient to people. That was absolutely true. In fact, and an experience that he had learned about and people want to silence him and keep him locked up. Because of it. And it, that guy. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> Um, um, but anyway, let's continue with this article. These tensions sometimes took explicit shape in public anti-Semitic statements among African Americans and anti-Black statements among Jews. Jews often felt particularly betrayed by African American anti-Semitism, arguing that Black people should be more generous given Jewish support of civil rights. Yeah, as, again, heard a lot of that like post-October 7th and that African-American leaders should more quickly and roundly condemn expressions of anti-Semitism in their community where such statements were made. Remember, Palestinians are also Semites. Let's start right. there. So all right. this anti-Semitism bullshit is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Anti-Judaism? No, it's anti-Zionism, okay? Which is a colonial project that is designed to systematically eliminate the Palestinian people. They certainly don't want to live alongside them in peace. Right. They certainly don't want to give them equal rights or an equal government or rights to a military or anything else. They want to establish Jewish supremacy. And that is kind of where we were going in this discussion also, and I think it's even in the article, is that there still is, and look at what's happening in Gaza right now, this aura, this mystique, this whatever you want to call it, where they believe that they are are supreme and there is a a pecking order there for sure right mm -hmm. and it's it's why you know it's the it's okay supposedly quote unquote you know that you were able to figure out and how to accept and deal with the fact that there was a two-tiered hierarchy though there should never have been mm -hmm. that's what society like and the whole thing fucked up like, could you could you imagine, Colin, in in New York, uh, you know, group of Jamaicans suddenly had a secret tunnel, you know, what what the secret press tunnel. might do, Come on. Secret right? Tunnel. Secret tunnel. Like, I mean, but, right? You know, but again, it kind of goes back to, and I tweeted this out earlier. It's the idea of like, okay, so if an Arab or hell, any person of color did what the IDF did to the world's city kitchen, central kitchen yeah. workers. They would be immediately marked as terrorists. Mm -hmm. but the entire city IDF, block would be bombed like right. they did in yeah. Philadelphia in the 1980s. Right. Yeah. But like they didn't the, even IDF, do that. the IDF does it, it's an accident or it's a mistake. And it's just kind of like, okay. All right. That's yeah. definitely like. A bias there <laughs> um you know Ugh. um but anyway 
Ghislaine tensions became more prominent within the civil rights movement as it moved north and into the cities in the mid-1960s. In the South, Jews, despite having white privilege, clearly did not have the same powers of a whites. In the North, Jews did not seem as different from other whites and were often the ones who wielded the most power in Black neighborhoods. The National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known as the Kerner Commission, which investigated the cause of the 1967 race riots, found that Jews owned about 30% of the stores in Black neighborhoods like Harlem and Watts, mm -hmm. and that many of the larger stores were owned by Jews and or had Jews' Jewish-sounding names. Sure, there's going to be yep. screaming and and and, that, but. and how and and how well did they pay the employees that worked in the in those neighborhoods? Not very well in right. the stores that they owned. And then, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, the mid 1960s also brought a shift within the civil rights movement from a focus on integration and alliance building to one of separatism. In 1966, NCC. SNCC and other radical civil rights groups made Black Power the new basis of their activism, calling for racial pride among African Americans and Black self-determination within the civil rights movement. Proponents of Black Power pointed, so this is like the movement where Kwame Ture kind of risen out from this. Yeah, and reparations too. And you reparations, know, this is where the, the movement for, for right. demanding reparations, I think, right. came out of. Right, so like the Black Panthers, you know, obviously you think of MLK, Acts, but also like Kwame Ture and the Black Power movement also came from out of this. Um, proponents of Black Power pointed out that Black people could not achieve true freedom unless they led the movement themselves. Otherwise, white people retained a degree of power and authority over them. They emphasized the need for Black self-sufficiency as well as Black cultural pride, i.g. Black is beautiful, and encouraged white activists to work on their own issues in some cases, expelling white leaders from their organizations. Also, looking at um, Muslim. Oh, okay. You're, you're going to talk about Nation Islam. Good. Yes. Perfect. I, These I, I, ideas I were not entirely new. Malcolm X, influenced by his conversion to the Nation of Islam, a black separatist religious sect, had advocated a platform of separatism in the early 1960s. By the late 1960s, however, black power had fundamentally changed the structures and assumptions of the civil rights movement and that inspired new organizations, such as the Black Panther Party, as well as a new wave of Afrocentrism in African-American culture, as demonstrated by the use of African names, African clothing styles, Afro hairstyles, etc. Um, Uhuru! Uhuru, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get into Zionism now. The Six-Day War provided another spur to Black Jewish tension. After Israel surprised surprising military triumph in June 1967, many American Jews experienced a surge of pride in Israel, an underdog nation that had succeeded in becoming a power to be reckoned with and felt a new or renewed commitment to Zionism. Some African Americans also saw the Jewish state as a model for a historically oppressed people empowering themselves. At the same time, many civil rights activists began to develop a more critical approach to Israel identifying with the Palestinians as an oppressed group seeking self-determination and castigating Zionism as a colonial racist movement. These tensions around Zionism came to a public head in 1977 when Andrew Young, a civil rights activist and the first African-American ambassador to the United Nations, met secretly with representatives of the Palestine, Palestine, Palestine Liberation. Yeah, well, right. Yasser Arafat's organization. Right. Yeah. This meeting sparked an uproar in which Jews were prominent among those who loudly condemned, condemned Young, and which resulted in President Carter asking Young to resign, which he did. Many felt that Jews had forced his resignation. Richie Torres? Uh, do, do I hear Richie Torres? Yes. Anybody say what? Yeah, <laughs> like, um, wait, go back to that for a second. Like, huh. so, so many things to unpack just in that that stuff there um the yeah again castigating zionism castigating it as a colonial racist movement no they didn't castigate it as it that's what it is all right so many civil rights okay it should be criticized and i had never really heard any criticism honestly very much growing up and this surge of pride in israel i wanted to talk about this this was obviously written by a jewish woman who is likely a zionist herself 
okay, right. who was raised Zionist and has that perspective of Jewish supremacy, because you see this surge of pride. Why was there a surge of pride in Israel? Because the U.S. and and Britain backed this artificial nation that they, not even a nation, but an artificial construct within mm -hmm. the Middle East on top of somebody else's land. I mean, it, like, so you had pride about that? Because they did. They fought off several Arab nations, but they didn't do it by themselves. Right. They did it with weaponry from the U.S. and Great Britain. <laughs> yeah. That was not an underdog anything. Those are the two biggest fucking powers in the world at the time, other than Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this whole framing of this this again, we've got to be the underdog and the oppressed all the time. All right, this this victimhood is constant victimization uh, because it it plays into the identity. Okay, right. if we're not victims, well then we, what are we? Well, then you're the aggressors that are fucking murdering children. Yeah, that's what you are and what you've been doing for 75 years while claiming victimhood. In my name, by the way. Fuck you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you need to I've been this. wanting to do this for a while, so good. I, I got shit to get off my chest. Uh, you, you, got, you got... We, we feel you on that. You got um, me and part, Lisa! <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, educational issue that divided some African Americans and Jews in the 1970s and beyond was affirmative action. Many Jews were wary of affirmative action programs for several reasons. Having benefited from meritocracy, they believed strongly in individual merit as the basis of equality of opportunity. They had negative associations with any program that smacked of quotas, which historically had been used to exclude Jews from schools clubs and workplaces, and they perceived that Jews would not benefit from policies that gave prefer preferential treatment to African Americans over whites. It Where'd that solidarity go? Hmm? Yeah. Where'd that solidarity go? Hmm. <laughs> go the ahead. case of Marco de Funes, a white Jewish man, highlighted the Jewish perspective on this issue. In 1971, de Funes was denied admission to the University of Washington Law School. He brought a suit against the school claiming that he had been the target of discrimination because other students with admission score, scores below the cutoff, as his were, had been admitted while he had not. The original trial found in Defunis' favor, but the Supreme Court of Washington reversed the decision. Because Defunis was Jewish and affirmative action already a heated issue in the Jewish community, the case attracted a great deal of attention from Jewish organizations and the Jewish press with a range of viewpoints expressing both in favor and opposition to affirmative action policies. In 1974, the case came before the Supreme Court and organizations such, the, such as the ADL supported yeah. the original decision. The Supre U.S. Supreme Court utterly decided that the case was mute because the Funis had been provisionally accepted to the school while the case was pending was about to graduate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. God forbid you set a precedent or actually like ruled on the thing so that people knew going forward what the what the prevailing opinion was on how this should be old, handled. But, old Jesse Jackson. We got Jesse Jackson. Over there the we years, go. Other incidents such as Jesse Jackson's off the record reference to New York as we're not saying that word. Um, I'll say it. Hi me town. I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. During his 1984 presidential campaign and the riots between Blacks and Jews in the heavily Hasidic and West Indian Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn in 1991 had flared tensions between the two communities, provoked in Jews... Ankle Rosenbaum. There was, it was a Black person that murdered a Jewish kid, I believe, that yes. started the, the tensions in Crown Heights mm -hmm. um, in 1991. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I, just a little... Okay. I remember that clearly, like... It was part of the news, and uh, again, not part of, not because of, um, uh, uh, part of the Jewish community. That was more like a New York area, thing. New York thing. Yeah, everybody, everybody knew about that. Um, so wait, provoked in Jews a mixture of anger and nostalgia about perceived golden age of Black Jewish relations, and made the subject of Black Jewish relations one of public concern, addressed in mainstream media. 
excuse me, of course, some argued that there never was a real alliance, just a checkered history of connections and collaboration, collaborations. But for some African Americans and Jews, this history of cooperation led to higher expectations regarding their relationships with, with one another than with other whites. And then when those expectations were not met, the disappointments on both sides was even sharper. Uh, Again, oh. this is the supremacy thing. I don't know. Did he? Did, did you just put that in there? No, uh, you, he. You already had that. You put that in. Oh, I did. Okay, I thought I didn't. So yeah, but um. So this was the tweet uh, that I mentioned before. The reason why I hate Zionism is because the ide ideology hijacks any attempts made toward black liberation. It's interesting that Zionists make the case for themselves to receive that owed to them for their suffering, but will not for black people. So this was in reference to me talking about reparations, because mm -hmm. as we know, actually go back, Reef. Oh, yeah. Um, our favorite senator in the world, this is Bernie Sanders. McCook. Mm -hmm. um, McCook was McCook. infamous in basically not, um, not standing for reparations for black people. So, mm. for those of you who need a reminder, right? This this is one of the prototypical people that walk around screaming, we have to support the black community. And then when it came time to actually support the black community, he disappeared. He was nowhere to be found. Right. He's sure. Just like he's waffling on fucking Gaza right now. And mm. we have to hold him to the strictest standards while he votes to send him fucking money for Iron Dome and weapons. Right. Not a huh? ahead, penny more. All right. And action. Fuck out of here. I am once again asking for your financial support. So the question specifically, out. my black son, okay, I know you're scared to say black, I know you're scared to say reparations because it seems oh, like well, every time I don't oh, think that's a fair I let you finish as well. But it seems like every time we talk about black people and us getting something um, for the systematic oppression and exploitation of our people, we have to include every other person of color. So today, can we please talk about specifically black people? And reparations we can talk about what I just indicated in my view is that when you have and you and I may have a disagreement on this because it's not just black it is Latino there are areas in America in poor rural areas he where can't. it's whites okay so I believe that in a country which has more Bro. income and wealth inequality than any other country <laughs> that yeah the time is long overdue to start investing in poor countries we have the highest rate of childhood poverty what? of any major country on earth. How about this country? Especially within the African-American community. So what I, I've said black 50 times. All right, that's the 51st time. Try, try All 69, right? but it 69 is, times. But this is a national issue. All right, so what, what we want and what I believe we should do, all right, is to invest most heavily in those communities most in need. And when you have 35% no, of black something. children living Pause in poverty. This. Please. We did Almost something done. specifically to the black community that we did not do to any other community that he wants to equivocate and point shit to. Mm -hmm. Dude, shut the fuck up and go away. <laughs> yeah. When you have half of the kids in this country in public schools on free or reduced lunches, when youth unemployment in the African-American community is 51%, those are exactly the kinds of communities that you invest in. Fuck you. Right. <laughs> but, and this is partially the reason why I wrote that tweet, because Bernie was not in support of reparations for us when it came time for reparations for Jewish people, mm. you could probably guess where this is going. Yeah. So this is from it's the Jewish Africa supremacy Di again. Right. Okay. So this is from the Africa Diaspora Network. I know Savvy has played this before. I think we probably played this once before too. Mm. But again, it bears repeating how when it comes to economic uh, standing, you know, well, 
Will can watch it, and you can you probably guys know, but you gotta hear it and see it for yourself. So go ahead. Now, Bernie Sanders isn't for reparations at all for African Americans, but guess who he's okay with having reparations? His own people. See, if you had an issue about reparations, then you would take that no matter what position that you're in, whether it's your own people or someone else. But he was okay with it for his own people. Now let's go ahead and go to the computer real quick. And I wanna show you how he was for reparations for his own people. So ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing here the Holocaust Rail Justice Act. Now this is the reparations that Bernie Sanders was for because as we know that he says an emphatic no when it comes to African Americans and their hurt and pain, but he says yes to his people. Now this is the bill that he was pushing for. Now it says a bill to ensure that the courts of the United States may provide an impartial forum for claims brought by United States citizens and others against any railroad organized as a separate legal entity arising from the deportation of United States citizens and others to Nazi concentration camps on trains owned or operated by such railroad and by the heirs and survivors of such persons. Now, Charles Chuck Schumer, he sponsored that bill. Okay. Now you may say, well, what Bernie and Sanders has to do with this one. Way. If we go to details here, co-sponsors, as you will see here, Bernard Bernie Sanders. So he co-sponsored oh, this Bernie. bill. Okay. And this is the bill that John he Kerry. wanted and he wanted reparations for his people. We want to prove that. So it just say in the summary of this is introduced. Was that right? Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. That Act doesn't seem like reparations. That seems like the ability to sue a rail company that had transported Jews during the Holocaust. Is that reparations? Yes. Uh, there's no govern. There's no government paying out money for this. I mean, the no? people respond. The people responsible, I would imagine. But here, let's. Grants let's U.S. Continue. District Courts over. Go ahead. Let them finish. Yeah. Grants U.S. District Court's original mm -hmm. jurisdiction over any civil action for damages or personal injury or death that arose from deportation of persons to Nazi concentration camps between January 1, 1942 and December 31, 1944 and is bought by or on behalf of such person against a railroad that owned or operated the trains on which the persons were deported and that was organized as a separate legal entity declares that no law limiting the jurisdiction of us courts shall preclude any such action and no such action shall be barred because a statute of limitations has expired it makes this act applicable to any action pending on or commenced after january 1 2002 and i said direct secretary of state to report to congress on the status of access to wartime records and archives concerning the wartime activities of any such railroad that engaged in the deportation Weird. of such persons to nazi concentration camps so this particular bill remember bernie sanders let's go back to details here bernie sanders was okay with this for his people but when it comes to us, it's a no. Now, this bill did not get put before the Congress and the Senate. It didn't get to that point. But it was the federal government didn't so pay much out any money with Wasn't this, going to. They start putting pressure on France. So what France did in return with this is say, you know what? Okay, we're going to get $60 million and we're going to give it to the U.S. Treasury for the Holocaust survivors. Take a look at this That's article written November 3rd, 2015. French to pay 60 million in reparations to Holocaust survivors in the U.S. and beyond. Okay? So, because they're trained, Bernie trained Sanders yeah, had that's no why. problem SNCF with France giving a reparation to his people. Now, they paid the $60 million to the Treasury Department, and they dispersed the money to the Holocaust survivors. Now, Bernie Sanders didn't say anything about that. He co-sponsored that particular bill. But when it comes to you, ladies and gentlemen, what does he say? Slave owners. No. 100%. That's what he says to you. Sure. Now, to get a little breakdown of it, we'll go to the New York but Post. Then if, then if those That's... survivors can't pay out, who does that money then get put to? The government would probably have to take over in that sense. I would imagine. You know. Right. 
So, but and we will scroll down. But here it's also weird that, that, like in 2011, like again, these are victims of. You're talking about the families who are going to sue the country of France 75 years later for transport. Mm -hmm. o okay, I. Yeah. Okay. And as we come, yeah, but uh, like you said, imagine if that was descendants of slaves could yes. sue for the ancestors of their enslavers for damages owed. Trillions. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like I would be fine with that. Down. I would 100% be fine right with that. Right here. The money should break down to about $100,000 for each uh, for the survivors and tens of thousands of dollars for spouses. Okay. So that's how that was broke down. So they got a hundred thousand each spouses, you know, people that wasn't even uh, a survivor. They got tens of thousands, but yet Bernie Sanders says no, when it comes to you, but he was okay with taking those payments. Cause you know, he got it. You understand what I'm saying? So Bernie Sanders is extremely foul, extremely. And I'm glad. With all yeah, but not for that. I mean, I don't know, for that, 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 for that that's, too, I'm a guy. I'll, I'll, I'm with him. Like it's a little shitty to okay. fucking act like you're for something, well, look, not no, look, for it. His his fam. No, look, his family literally. He literally lost family members in the Holocaust. Uh huh. So okay. he's and literally, you know. So he's got a personal connection. The issue isn't directly that he did to that. the issue is that he won't be there when it's someone else. Like right. that's the issue. That's the issue. They had. I, I don't know if something has been presented to him where he would have be able to vote on something similar. All right. And again, I'm no defender or no fan of his, but in this case, would it, if it were put in similar terms, would he have said no to that too? If it were from our, I don't know. I don't that know. That. Well, we're going to find him. out, I guess. Uh, that lady just asked him like in the last clip and he, he fucking word right. salad yes, around it. The different, the difference is, is, Define what "quote unquote" reparations. It, does it mean a direct check from the U.S. government to every African American? And how much France? is that? What does that look like? Yes, a direct check from France. <laughs> yes, like, yes, yes. Well, right. Well, we know his answer to that is no. Uh, okay. And why? And why? Which is one of the reasons because of many that he's a fucking dickhead. So right. Because it's it's costing the generations of people that didn't necessarily do that, and that's I am guessing would be his argument or rationale. I I don't yeah. know because I couldn't argue rationally f against it. You know, like well, here's the thing: we were promised, well, at least in this country, you were like African Americans were promised forty acres and a mule. Yeah, right. Where's that? And, they, and where's that at? Right. You know, so this is long overdue for African Americans in this country. And I, and I keep saying this on the show all the time, like, especially to black people, our beef is not necessarily just with America. Like, again, America didn't become a country until 100 years after they dropped us here. It was uh, the British and all of them that are also responsible, too. I, I say if, so, if any of those squad members want to shake shit up for some reason, try making it to where African defendants of slaves can sue their enslavers let's see what happens see if that puts pressure to get reparations it worked for the jewish folks to get stuff from france why not right and germany right i'd give it a shot like they were record they were germany recognized there's the original spin in terms mm -hmm. of the holocaust and they I'm not saying immediately, but relatively soon after, they rectified that. So the idea is like, so, but here's my issue with this, though. Like, reparations, the idea of Black people receiving reparations is low. We, we have our work to do regarding that. But yeah. the issue that I have is, especially with Jewish people, and again, in terms of the education, like, like growing up, just I economics. About, right? I look back growing up, I learned about the Holocaust up the ass. Well, we're about like to get to night, that, right? Right, um, night by Elie Wiesel. It that's required reading basically now in high schools. Now, I read that book in middle school. So, the idea of the Holocaust 
you know, and the idea of having sympathy for Jews in that way in light of what they were with, like Diary of Anne Frank, all that, you know, it's kind, trauma. Of built, uh -huh. it's kind of built into, you know, what I was raised in school. But the idea well, Harry comes, Tubman, look, Harry, we, we, in other ways, we, they tried to make an equivalency that doesn't exist. It, you cannot possibly equate anywhere close to the two just because of the economic advantages alone. Right. But it's the idea of, for me, you know, the idea of the Holocaust, which for you, for Jewish people, that's relatively recent history. Like, that has somewhat been rectified. But the idea that... Yeah, but that or, wasn't enslavement. That was just right. extermination. That wasn't sure. like you you had to go... It was it was temporary. You um, had to go work in a camp or you were going to be killed. Right, but... Oh, sorry. I mean, so you're I, saying, like, slavery? It wouldn't like, have, it we wouldn't have been temporary if the Russians didn't decide to march their way to Berlin. You know, like... Well, it wasn't going to be enslavement, though. It was going to be extermination until there were none left. And I then, mean... Yeah, but Those until there's none left, you'll keep them working, I imagine. Like, <laughs> anyway, you you have this from Jennifer Young, I think, that goes into a bit more of this, yeah. I do believe. Are we not, yeah, so I'm not going to pull all of it because it was a long article. There were, I think there were a couple of things that you in particular uh, wanted to focus on in the... Um, right. But it's September 1949, the 84-year-old African-American scholar W... E.B. Du Bois, and we talked about him Dubois. On the, over oh, a year right. ago, uh, visited the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto. I've seen something of human upheaval in the world, he wrote, but nothing in my wildest imagination was equal to what I saw in Warsaw in 1949. In 1903, Du Bois, du Bois famously declared that the problem of the 20th century is a problem of the color line. Um, but after gaining first-hand knowledge of the destruction of Polish Jewry more than four decades later, <laughs> Du Bois readjusted his understanding of race in America. He began to see that slavery and racism were not, as he long thought, a separate and equal phenomenon, but, a larger, but part of a larger problem of perverted teaching and human hate and prejudice. Uh, da, 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 da. While allowing that racial oppression functioned even beyond the color line, Du Bois was careful not to post the asymmetry between the Jewish and Black experience. Rather, he argued for an understanding of the asymmetricality of history. Each group's experience was historically distinct and neither right. entirely unique or reducible to a universalized, a temporal narrative of common suffering. Du Bois right. argued that the particular and the universal need needed to be held together in suspension. Since Du Bois reconceived the color line's boundaries, he now saw racism and oppression as relational principles <laughs> rather than fixed social categories. Only by understanding the multidirectional nature of structural injustice could such equality be overcome. So economic solidarity was is much more prevalent and, and, yeah. and much a much better guide to judge whether there is actual kindred kindred you know, like kinship there. Right. But but essentially what I determined that in the article what I was saying here is that Du Bois, I think kind of what you were saying before, Indy, like Jewish people kind of associate like your experience in terms of the Holocaust and then like in the Torah, you know, in terms of, you know, like, you know, like what you study in in temple, like we were slaves out of Egypt, like, and we and right, we, like one right. like one in the same, essentially. And, and Moses let not, us out, yes, right. And it's not like it's very distinct in terms of experience, in terms of history, in terms of culture. So, so to kind of level the two as you know, our experiences are ultimately like uh, like, and therefore we should have this solidarity with each other, that's kind of where it's a very superficial mindset to have in terms of being in solidarity with each other in that regard. So, so I think that's what, um, you know, in this article, what uh, I think Du Bois was saying here. Um, there also is, is the, you know, exploitation of the black community by the Jewish community financially. 
again, there always needs to be this this hierarchy. It seems mm-hmm. it right in order for thing. You know, like it can never be that that the wealthiest person in the room is the black person. It's it's got, and it's not a racial. It's not. It. I don't. I. I. It's hard to explain how that always is, but somehow it always ends up that way, doesn't it? Hmm. Yep. Anyway, just as, the, just as the boys used the Jewish experience to rethink the problem of the color line, American Jews used their encounters with blacks as a way to understand their own position as a minority, particularly as immigrant Jews began to prosper economically and to experience the benefits that whiteness conferred. In his book, A Right to Sing the Blues, Jeffrey Melnick argued that the concept of black Jewish relations does not describe a historical relationship, but rather theoretically functions as a story told by Jews about interracial relations. Uh, Although many Jewish American Jews lived in proximity to Blacks, few developed intimate relationships with them. I think that's key there. Rather, they engaged in an internal one-sided conversation about race that helped them to apprehend their relationship to whiteness, to anti-Sentinism, and to racial oppression. Eastern European Jewish immigrants worked out their relationship with Blacks in the pages of the Yiddish press, in Yiddish literature, and through philanthropy and political action. Jews on the left in particular championed Black political causes and sought to interpret their simultaneous vulnerability in and culpability for America's racial hierarchy for fiction, journalism, and social activism. Well, and I will say that the Jewish community recognizes that there has been under you undervalued and and under um, showcased talent, and it, you know it's cultural appropriation in some ways. Where they look to the black the black community is great at, at trend setting, and they're incredibly intelligent, and, and 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 they've had all this to offer, but a lot of people never wanted to hear it. But the Jews were certainly open to it and benefiting from that. Right. Right. Um, In The Price of Whiteness, Eric Goldstein writes that Jews needed to claim whiteness in order to succeed, but that many Jews' ongoing commitment to a distinctive identity complicated their attempts to claim whiteness. The less different Jews became, the more they claimed difference as a marker of identification with radicalized others, rather than with white privilege. This claim to difference served as an eternal identity marker for Jews, particularly as later generations lost the connection to their immigrant class and shed other aspects of linguistic, cultural, and religious identity identity that distinguished them from their white neighbors. The demographic- Blended and Americanized is yes. what you're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. The demographics of the post-war era, upward mobility, suburban settlement, and the commonlent transition from radically diverse urban areas to racially homogeneous neighborhoods meant that Jews and Blacks were even less likely to identify with each other or see themselves as threatened by a common enemy. In the post Right. In the post scottsboro era, Jews were more likely to see the mobilization of Black political movements as a threat to Jewish interests, rather than as a response to structural inequality that affected both Jews and Blacks. Yep. Uh, oh, well, see, it's, it's interesting, because Jews, Jews in this country have always kind of looked over our shoulder at the Christian, at the white Christians, who run everything, effectively, in a lot of ways, or did, and are the feel like they are the you know this is a christian nation and they're they they are the majority of of what and again they talked about in the south and as you move further north because you have less influence of religion the further north the christian the christianity the further north you move in this country i just wanted to mention that yeah uh oh just like so have something in the age of black lives matter american jews still ponder the question of white privilege a few turned to the boys or snaps to expl- explicate an understanding of racial oppression as asymmetrical, relational, and historically Pacific. However, many Jews continue to struggle to understand their own place in a radicalized society and grapple with their own agency to either embrace that world or tear it down. These dynamics continue to play out in an unfinished drama whose next act remains to be written. 
It's um, the battle that I'm literally fighting with my family right now. What do you mean by that? Um, struggling to understand our own place in a radicalized society. Put that back up for a second. Because I've figured it out and I got through an education in the last few years about formation of Israel, about the use of our religion as a bludgeoning tool to control and to divide, um, use of religion in general about that, but about the lies that were told to the Jewish kids in my generation in order to sell the glorification and the this this love for Israel again didn't exist when my grandparents were alive right so you know and and you know the, this myth about how well it's not necessarily even a myth but how it was gifted to the jewish people but they never talk about that anybody lived there or what happened in order to make that happen it was just they were they gave it to us and we we it was our homeland to begin with and we we deserved it and right. they killed us everywhere else and we had to have somewhere we can go and 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 live free from oppression but right. what happened to the united states and what happened right. to and the united kingdom exactly. and what happened right. to all these all these other and countries where we were able to live free there was a part here i put i didn't pull it but i think that was the part that you wanted that really resonated with you in the i think just in terms of like you know, you guys, Jewish people talk about the idea of having a home to escape to. But I argue, right. especially if you live in the West now, you're there. Like, that was never your home. Right. Right. Your home. Like, you know, I think, again, because you're shielded with whiteness, you can get away with, you can enjoy the benefits of what that offers you in terms of <laughs> I'm sh I'm shielding myself with whiteness <laughs> with a cracker <laughs> with a saltine That's probably not the way to do it dude That's I mean That's probably not the way to do it The cracker defense is a is fine don't worry about it Nah but, but you know and I know Brie Brianna Joe Gray said this when she had her interview with Dean Phillips, which really resonated with me, is the idea of, like, as a Black person, I'm not safe here. Like, I argue I'm not safe in really any country in this world. So, like, right. other than... And it's not like I can go back to... Niger just go back to Nigeria and Cameroon, even though... Ancestral. But and you ain't right. black, right? Of, right have, of return, yeah. We talked right. about that. I don't uh -huh. have, I don't have, and I have, I have the DNA testing to prove it, you know. But I'm not given that birthright, quote unquote, to return to those countries. And Liberia doesn't count for those of you looking in the chat, like because I heard that too, <laughs> you know. We should probably actually report on that at some point, you know, like the issues with Liberia and all. Uh, okay. Because that's essentially like a black version of Israel that, you know, really hasn't gone anywhere. Honestly, uh, okay. uh, I, mean, I found the quote. I found the quote. I found the yeah. quote for that other article. Quote: The identity of American Jewish liberals and radicals, the presumption of blacks and Jews, compromise a community of the oppressed. That Jews are never acting more true to their religious and ethnic heritage than when they are working side by side with blacks. To create a society free of racial and religious prejudice, which I, in theory, agree with very much so. And I said, this is definitely how I was raised. But we were also told that there were also big differences, which we never had to go through. So it's not the same. No. The religious discrimination and racial discrimination were, of course, very different. Right. And I think that's the key is kind of understanding. Look, as I said, and I think we have a clip to kind of end this that we've pulled. But it's the idea of, actually, let's just play it now, and then we can kind of get into it then. So, mm -hmm. so this is from Donahue, like the 80s Donahue. You remember Donahue? Uh, oh, wow. Like Oprah became in vogue. But, uh, but I think this woman kind of summarizes, I think, what I want to say to you in terms of that. So, mm -hmm. so go ahead, Reed. How would you like to 
to say to, to this gentleman, I would like to say to this gentleman and all other people who are not blessed with melanin at this point in time, to understand that what has happened in our history is that you have been misinformed as much as we have been misinformed. Much of the information that is brought forth, not only from Dr. Muhammad, but other areas, other scholars, are not available to you, as a sister said, in your curriculums that you have for 400 years when you did not allow us to read and write and was being hidden. Whether you, sir, personally did that or not, it was a legacy that was passed on to you. And I end by saying the Holocaust is simply the greatest atrocity on film. Ours was not filmed. Yeah. That dude's book of days still gets me. Was that, that Dave right Chappelle? There. It looks like Dave Chappelle. No, no it's... Um, I know it's not. No. Bishop Tutu? No. That's not no, Bishop Tutu. No. But that... That's a lot of damage. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's... But that, I think, for me, is key. Because your history, Indy, has been... Much more. Yeah, way much more. You know, you we are able to well, probably not so much now given this day and age, but at least, you know, the Holocaust is talked about on the regular in school. Pretty much every school you can think of. Now the Holocaust was, is in some way, shape, or Dr. form Abdul talked about. Khalid Muhammad on Donahue. And I think that's Phyllis Yvonne Stickney. Uh, was the lady in that? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, just just FYI for people who want to look that up, I'd like to see that right. whole episode. I'm sure it's interesting. Um, yeah. So you probably maybe if you're trying to try and do a rumble on that. But yeah. anyway, but yeah, I think that's the point. Is that your history is, for the most part accepted and talked about and <laughs> dissected and and even now like in terms of what's happening in gaza the idea is like we suffered from the holocaust and we don't want that to happen to us ever again so this is why we have a right to defend ourselves and all that kind of stuff when black people talk about that in terms of slavery usually the answer is shut the fuck up um you're not slaves anymore uh rise above it um, things are a lot better for you now. Kiss off. Hillary Clinton, get over it. Right. Hillary get Clinton say, get I'm, over it. Right. Yeah. Like, it's only probably... I don't give a shit. Like, it's only probably within recent years that the idea of slavery, I think, we're just beginning to have more of a conversation seriously about it. And I would ar argue recently, you know, but again, as I said, growing up in school, like I learned the Holocaust up the ass. Like we didn't did learn about Tulsa. We didn't learn about Wilmington. We didn't right. learn about right. all kinds of uh, uh, Juneteenth. We never right. learned Juneteenth. Right. I only knew of Juneteenth since 2016. And honestly, but then obviously it became a holiday. Emmett Till but, yeah. from Dave Chappelle. That's who I learned right. about Emmett Till from. Which that should not right. be the case. So for, right. So for us, our history is either hidden because, and, 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 and I will call Black people out on this too. We do not do a good job collectively compared to Jewish people in knowing our history collectively. So that I kind of fall on us in some regard. That being said, a lot of that history has been purposely of being erased, you know, in terms of curriculum, in terms of culture, that there's a lot that really we, sh you know, the powers that be do not want us to know. Because God forbid right. that we actually do know it and stand up against it. Um, but that's another topic for another day. Yeah. But as you she said, with? you know... By the way? Yeah. No, I think for me... <laughs> Like, that's key in terms of we really need to have conversations like these among each other. But I think, and I'm just saying this as a Black person, so continue as Indy. And I think you've done, you know, I think obviously being a part of INN, like, I think we've naturally kind of had these conversations anyway. 
So I really, again, we appreciate you again to have that safety and able to kind of share a lot of this stuff with you. But I think ultimately that's kind of what I want to see, not just in the independent media space, but I think just across the board that Black people should have to be able to really have that fortitude, but also feel comfortable in talking to our Jewish brothers and sisters who really, really want to know to kind of give in the real in terms of, look, we understand, we get all this solidarity, solidarity in terms of what we experience in terms of the suffering that both of us call, but at the same time, it's not the oppressed Olympics too. Like, and I feel a lot of ways it's kind of played out as, as such, but our experiences are totally different. And the thing is, especially if you're white and Jewish, you're able to benefit, you're shielded from a lot of the stuff that makes you an other in this country that doesn't give you that same perspective as I have living in this country. And especially for me as an immigrant, you know, Straight so up discrimination over skin color too. I mean, right. So I think we yeah. definitely need to have more conversations where we do not look at our experiences as romanticized. It's all walking hand in hand in the civil rights movement, but kind of get to the tension as to why there are some issues, even among blacks and Jews that we still have that I think, we kind of know, but we don't talk about openly. And I think if we really want to have true solidarity, then we should feel comfortable enough, especially since we generally understand oppression, that we should be able to have those conversations with each other and not have evil side feel offended. But if we are really looking to have that true liberation that both communities speak of, we need to have conversations as to what that will look like. And I think especially yeah. for Black people that we really need your support, or at least we would like to really have you be fervent in, in that solidarity of sharing the stuff that that is unique to us to elevate that. Um, and have the conversation. Jews love to talk. <laughs> I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> okay. We will talk and listen we will listen. I mean, a lot, some won't listen. You might not like what they have to say also, but the conversation is what's important. The dialogue and the coming together to discuss these things, to identify, yeah, where can we come together? Where can we work together and find common ground? And how can we help with the education uh, aspect? Because the Jewish community has been of course, focus, you know, heavily focused on education for children and uh, for years. But and if I'd love to see more equality and equity when it came to that, you know, education, especially early childhood education, and that is specifically an economic issue, right? When it comes to nursery school and pre-K and the ability to afford it, the ability to have somebody, a parent at home because you don't have two working parents that have to be working. There's all kinds of financial issues that arise early on from childhood and from infancy almost, you know, right. neonatal care even, you know, right. uh, to, to postnatal care. And there, there is so much that we can still do to understand each other, to work together and to make things more equitable and, and right. more even. As a quick because aside, there still is a, a financial supremacy that that is un, an unfair disadvantage because of ADOS, effectively, in yeah. a lot of ways. As a quick aside, um, like what I'm going to be testifying on um, tomorrow night is, and the, like uh, our budget for DC locally was released, and basically it's a shitstorm of. Fuckery, basically. Like, it's basically like cuts here, cuts there, cuts everywhere. Uh, but more particularly, one of the big issues was there is funding essentially for early childhood educators. And I feel for early childhood educators, especially if you work in like nonprofits or like any daycare, because they get no money. They get yep. pennies traditionally, because Many of these workers are women, older women usually, of color, and usually immigrant, especially in low-income areas. 
and they do not get really if they're lucky to get a living wage, you know, that's lucky for them. And the funding that helps to support their salaries, you know, in DC is essentially being cut. So I had a testimony, you know, I've talked about like advocating for a child tax credit in DC. I had to change my testimony today to kind of mention this funding that's being cut. And one of my council members said it best, you know, like, I guess when they were kind of talking through it in preparation for the 500 people who is coming to testify tomorrow all day, um, that, you know, when it comes to kids, give, given the budget, basically it's like, fuck them kids. And the idea is that you either get them in school to actually do something with them, or you get them in the street. Take your pick. So I'd rather try and get them in school where we actually have a chance to do something with them versus getting them in the street or worse yet, getting them like in the grave. But I think it kind of speaks to that, what you're saying in the, in terms of the education needs to be there, the willingness to kind of have these, com com even though they might be uncomfortable, might ha also has to be there. But we also have to talk about what true solidarity is in terms of what does that actually mean? It's not necessarily being like, oh, we're one and the same and blah, blah, and kumbaya. It's like, no, what are the differences? How can we challenge each other in terms of these differences? And what can we really do in terms of really working that solidarity for to each other yep. for each other based on that mutual understanding? We don't have to agree, but we have to have that mutual understanding that our histories are different, our experiences are different, but that's okay. Because as long as we're able to kind of have that understanding, you know, then we're better able to support each other in that way, rather than a superficial stance of through religion or like culture or just living, just having to be side by side among. And, and I wish there actually, and in just doing research for this, most of the articles I found were like that. It was just the rom romanticizing of that relationship between Jews and Black people in this country. And I think we need to ha actually have serious conversations of what makes us different and unique um, and being able to kind of work through that together. And the hard work of Black people certainly made a lot of Jewish people rich and wealthy in this country. Let's let's straight up acknowledge that. Right. I don't know if I actually did. But... Yeah. All right. Uh, I know uh, you've got one more story you want to get to. Yeah, but before uh, I gotta we use that. The... Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, so yeah, long cycle, but I think it's definitely worthwhile. And shout out to Savvy and JB if they do talk about this issue, because I know they plan to talk about this issue as well. Uh, please engage them in the chat respectfully, please. And like anything that you might have heard tonight that resonates, definitely share with them. You know, but I think, you know, in the independent media space, we definitely need to have more of these conversations. So with that being said, if you want us, and that especially on INN, to continue having conversations like this, you know, feel free to uh, help us via donation. As we thankfully put up, you can see our QR codes so you're able to scan. And as we said, all of your proceeds will go towards Jesse's new computer. Um, please help us in helping us, you know, just, um, getting up to 2k, uh, hopefully by the summer, I guess, Yeah. you know, um, and then like, be sure to like, and subscribe as we are heavily suppressed. Be sure to make a comment. We definitely read them all. Um, and we really do appreciate your love and support in the comments. Um, and yeah, thank you guys. And thank you Indy for being willing to have this conversation with me.